Hey guys, Helping Hands here, and I'm here to teach you how to use artillery in Foxhole. There are many types of artillery in Foxhole, and today I will be going over 120mm and 150mm artillery and their variants. To begin with, let's start by showing off the land variant guns. For Colonials, we have the field gun 120mm variant. This gun can be placed on a flatbed, like all the other in place guns, however it can now also be towed by certain vehicles including trucks, half tracks and heavy trucks. Once unhitched, it can be moved slowly by a crew of two into position. To tow a gun, first you must make sure the field artillery is not deployed. Then, you must back up a suitable towing vehicle like this heavy truck to the rear of the gun. Once it is close enough, jump out of your truck and go to the point where the two entities meet. Press Shift E on your keyboard and an option should appear which lets you hitch the gun. Select this option and you should notice a small joining animation. Now you should be good to go. This gun, along with all artillery in place guns, can have one shell in the chamber and one on standby, in the gun's inventory. To fire the gun, you must first deploy it by pressing the F key by being on the left side of the gun. The right side of the gun changes the distance by scrolling up and down with the mouse wheel in increments of 10 meters. The right side also fires the gun with left mouse and R to reload. New to the Colib 120, you can now change the azimuth left and right by 30 if you hold down right click either left or right side of the gun. The max distance on this gun is 250 meters and its minimum is 100. This gun is known as the Thunderbolt and is the Colib 150 mm gun. To change the azimuth here, you need two players on the gun and the left player must press the A key to rotate left or the D key to rotate right. This is exactly the same for the Warden 120mm and 150mm guns you see here. The other difference here is that the right side of the gun changed the distance by increments of 6 meters and not 10 meters compared to the Collie 120. The max range of this gun is 350 meters and its minimum is 200. Next up for the Colonials is the Sarissa variant of the Lance 46 battle tank. Basically, this is a self propelled gun which has an inventory of 3 shells and 1 in the chamber. There are three main seats in this vehicle, the driver, the cannoneer, the engineer and four passenger seats. The driver must once again here press F to deploy the gun, once deployed the vehicle is immobile. The engineer loads the cannon and presses E to repair the vehicle with BMATs. Note you cannot reload and repair at the same time. The cannoneer fires the gun and changes the distance in increments of 3.5 meters. The passengers can use their binoculars from their seat as well as secondary weapons like pistols. Compared to the 150 Thunderbolt, the Sarissa fires almost twice as fast. Finally, we move on to the Warden 120 and 150 mm guns. These guns are both emplacements and have the same minimum range of 100 meters and max range of 300 meters. As they are emplacements, they don't take much damage from AT weapons like 68 mm shells, stickies, and flask grenades. However, the 120 mm field artillery from the Colonials always acts as a vehicle and therefore takes more damage from these AT weapons. Both of these Warden guns change distance in increments of 8 meters. Now onto the Floodstain self propelled gun. It acts in the exact same way as the Colley Sarissa does, however there's only one passenger seat and you currently can't use your binoculars from it. Therefore you would have to disembark and spot from the ground. The Floodstain offers a bit better protection for the crew compared to the Sarissa. Also the Floodstain has a different increment difference as well, going up by 7.6 meters per scroll wheel. The next section of this video will cover how we make these guns. Colonial 120mm field artillery must be built at a vehicle garage in a town that has one available. It costs 50 art mats to make one. Once made, you can package the gun by going up to it and accessing its inventory by pressing E. If it's still in the garage, you might still need to press Shift plus E to access it. Press the package symbol here and your character will start packaging the gun. Once done, jump in a nearby crane if one is available and crane it out of the vehicle garage. If no crane is available, you can make one at a town hall for 125 BMATs. If you're using a mobile crane, make sure to fill up with either diesel or petrol first. To do so, bring up your inventory by pressing tab and then left click on the can of fuel to equip it. Then press three on your keyboard to bring it out. Now go up to the crane and press right and left mouse together to refill the crane. Once that's done, press Shift plus Q to bring up the seat menu and enter the driving seat. Press the F button to deploy the crane. It's worth noting the crane can only be deployed on flat ground. Once in a crane, you must hold down the right mouse button and drag your mouse cursor over to the packaged gun. 
Once you see two cog icons, press left click to pick up the gun. Next, you'll either want to hitch it onto something so you can take it to the front line or get a flatbed and put the gun on it. A flatbed may be stored in the local storage depot or seaport, but you can also make one here at a vehicle garage as well for 30 R mats. The cost of the flatbed is the same on both factions. When you have one ready, drive it near to the crane and your field artillery. Get in the crane and do the same thing again to drag the package gun over to your flatbed. Once again, you'll need to see the two cog icons on top of the flatbed before the game will let you place it on it. To make the Colonial 150mm Thunderbolt, you must come to a construction yard which looks like this and can be found in specific towns. This is what the icon looks like on the map. You will need 195 arm mats to make one. Follow the exact same process as before with packaging, craning and using a flatbed. The Warden 120 and 150 millimeters are also built here at a construction yard in the exact same way. The Warden 120 costs 35 R mats, and their 150 is worth 175 R mats. It's also worth noting that you can mass produce these guns at a mass production factory, which are located in the back lines. This is what one looks like on the map. For the 120 millimeter for the Colonials, you can get 10% off the R mat cost per crate, but not for the 150mm. Each crate has three guns and must be submitted to a storage depot or a seaport so they can be accessed. Making guns in the mass production factory takes a long time, so make sure to factor this in when considering using this factory. In this next clip I demonstrate to you how to submit a crate into a depot and then pull an individual gun. You can tell an order is done in the mass production factory by the green tick on the right side of the menu. Pressing this will pull a single crate onto the pad. Crane the crate onto your flatbed and then drive to the local depot. Once at the depot, crane the crate onto the depot pad and then choose the stockpile at the top right where you want to submit to first. This is important as if you submit to public, anyone can grab the guns. Once you've chosen which stockpile you want to submit to, click submit loading area equipment. Notice how one crate of 150mm Thunderbolts are now available. To unpackage the guns into the stockpile, right click the icon and then click the desired stockpile you wish to release to. Now you click on this icon here and you can pull the guns individually. Once the item has been pulled you can then package the loading air equipment and then crane the gun straight onto the flatbed without having to leave the crane. The last thing I want to add is that the 120 and 150 millimeter guns can only be created in the locations I have mentioned if the technology has been unlocked in the engineering centre. So if you're unable to build one even though you have the materials, this is probably why, as you'll need to wait until it unlocks later in the war. To make one of the new self-propelled guns, you would have need to unlock tier 3 facilities and have created many of the different kinds of assembly materials and steel, as well as created a large assembly station. This is a very complex process and will be covered later in another video if you're interested. Next up, I will discuss how to position and secure your guns. It is incredibly important to make sure to secure your position, otherwise enemy players can easily get to you and kill your guns before you've made a difference. In this clip you can see how easy it was for me to get behind the enemy and kill this Colonial 120mm gun with some sticky bombs. Before bringing up your artillery, first you will want to build up and secure the area. Ideally, you will want to build a ring of defences around the point where you intend to put the guns. It is generally a good idea to wait until you have active AI before you put the guns down as the AI defences will help defend you against enemies. If you do not wait for active AI, your defences will not attack enemies. To tell the difference between active and non-active AI, non-active AI has a small flag above the structure, whereas active has a large flag. To know if a base will support active AI, you must check the base garrison level. Only level 1 means it will need 10 people setting their spawn here to turn the AI on. If the second garrison level is reached, it will be active no matter what. Make sure you are protected from every angle and have a mix of infantry and AT defences like you see here. To further secure the position, you can lay a second ring of defences and put down mines and barbed wire. Now let's talk about the importance of octagon trenches. Octagon trenches are crucial for emplaced guns, as when an emplaced gun is put into one, the gun becomes much more durable. To build an octagon trench, you must first equip a shovel and press B on your keyboard. A build menu should pop open. Next click the shovel build menu icon, and then click on the octagon icon. Find a suitable place to build it. 
If the outline is yellow, you can place it at that location. It is, if it is red, you cannot. Hold the right mouse button down and drag your cursor around to change its angle. Once the blueprint is placed, you must then shovel it in. Once dug, you now have a tier 1 Otacon Trench. You will now want to upgrade it to tier 2 to again increase its durability, and to do so you will need 50 B mats. Equip your hammer now, and press F while looking over the trench. You should now see some text pop up. Next, press E to enter upgrade mode, and another building menu should pop up. Press the tier 2 trench upgrade option and start hammering away to upgrade the trench. Finally, it's now time to place your gun into the octagon. Drive your flatbed with the gun on top close to the trench and get a crane to pick up the gun and place it in the trench. Be careful of standing underneath the gun, however, when it's being placed or you might get crushed. Next, we need to discuss shells. Here we have a pallet of 150mm shells on the left and a pallet of 120mm shells on the right. The 150mm shells look yellow and the 120mm shells look like a pale skin colour. There are two ways to create a pallet. The first is at a construction yard for 25 B mats, and the second is at a facility pad for also 25 B mats. The facility pad makes the pallet in seconds, but does need power to operate. In this clip, you can see I refilled the power station with petrol to turn the power back on. Once the pallet is done, I once again pressed Shift E to access the pallet's infantry so I could package it. There are two ways to make shells. The first is making crates of shells at your standard factory in towns. Here is what a factory looks like on the map. Each crate contains five shells and you can make four crates at a time. One crate of 120mm costs 60 BMATs and 15 explosive materials and one crate of 150mm costs 120 BMATs and 10 heavy explosive materials. Once you have crates made you can submit them to stockpiles in bases or at storage depots. You can also directly submit them onto pallets. To submit crates onto an empty pallet, drive up carefully to the pallet without getting too close and press E to access its inventory. The reason you want to be careful is if you touch the empty pallet with your truck, it will destroy it, as seen here. Pallets with supplies on do not get destroyed if you touch them with vehicles, so don't worry about that. Once you have the inventory of the pallet open, right click on one of your crates and hit the option to submit all to the stockpile. You should now see all the shells on the pallet. The other more efficient method to make and pallet shells is at an ammunition facility. For one 120mm shell, it's three explosive and two construction materials, and for one 150 shell, it's two heavy explosive and three construction materials. The ammunition facility needs power for it to run at all times, so remember that. To pallet up shells from an ammo facility, you must first need a pallet, a BMS Mineseeker small train engine with a car on the back. These can maybe be made at the same facility where you made the pallet. To pull shells onto a pallet from here, you must first put them onto the train car. To do so, jump onto the train engine and access the ammunition facility. Then, click on your car icon and then right click on the shell type you wish to pull. You can currently pull 15 shells at a time. Once you have 100 shells, jump off the train and jump back onto the car. Make sure your pallet is close to the cart when doing this and away from the ammunition facility so you don't accidentally submit the shells back into the ammo facility. Once you are on, press left click and you should see all the shells transfer over to the pallet. Pallets can hold up to 120 shells so repeat this process until the pallet is filled. When your pallet is filled, package it and place it back onto a flatbed ready to be sent off to the front. Once you and your artillery crew have arrived at the front line with your pallets of shells, I would advise only to have one pallet on the ground at all times, in case of an enemy counter battery. Pallets of shells that are on the ground are very vulnerable to HE weapons and indirect fire, so by only having one pallet on the ground rather than numerous ones, you minimise the risk. It's also advisable to put the pallet a little bit further away from the guns as well, as when counter fire comes in from enemy concrete howitzers, they will target your gun, and if your pallet is close by, it will be hit by the splash damage. Notice here how I use my pistol to unpackage the pallet of shells. This is actually quicker than going up to it and unpackaging it the normal way by pressing E, and you don't do any damage to the pallet when you do this. While standing near the pallet, you can grab a shell by pressing the V key on your keyboard. With the shell in hand, walk over to the gun you wish to load and press V again to submit it. The best way to unload shells, however, is by pulling from a truck. It's much faster and safer. To pull shells with a truck, drive up to the pallet and press E to access the pallet. Then press shift and left click to pull three shells at a time. 
Once the truck is filled, reverse the back of the truck to the edge of the artillery trench and jump out of the vehicle and run to the back. Access the inventory of the truck again by pressing E and then holding down the ALT key and left clicking all the shells. This will drop all the shells at your feet. If you do this correctly, the load on the gun will not need to climb out of the pit to grab the shells. There are four roles in an artillery crew. The gunner, the loader, the spotter, and the shell runner. The gunner generally reloads, fires the gun, and changes the distance. The loader continuously goes back and forth between the pallet of shells, constantly submitting shells to the gun. They will also jump on the left side of the gun and help change the azimuth as and when needed. The spotter is forward from the gun, using a pair of binoculars to spot enemy structures and communicates to the gunner and loader, telling them to adjust their distance and azimuth accordingly. It is also recommended that a spotter takes a recon uniform so that they're harder to spot on enemy watchtower coverage. Finally, the shell runner is someone who is making sure the artillery crew never run out of shells and will be dropping off pallets of shells for the gun. One very important factor in firing artillery is the direction and the strength of the wind, as it can massively change the direction of the shell. Before you fire, check to see which direction the wind is blowing and its strength so you know how much you would need to adjust by. This gift is a great example of the strength of the wind and I'll post a link in chat for you guys if you would like to check it in your own time. When manning artillery guns, the number one thing you should be carrying on your persons is basic materials and a hammer as you'll need to be able to repair the guns, the pallet of shells, and the trench the guns are sitting in, if needed. You should also equip a radio and check your map often to see if your position is safe. You never know when a group of partisans might try their luck and take you out. A gas mask is also not a bad idea, along with some binoculars, so you can check to see what danger might be on its way and react in time. Once the gun is placed, the first you can do is eyeball the rough direction you wish to aim in. To do this, look at the target you wish to aim at on the map, and then turn the gun until your character's orange arrow is facing that direction. This is a very good habit to adopt. It is also worth noting that each grid on the map is 125 meters by 125 meters, so you can roughly calculate what distance you would need for your first shot before the spotter gets into position. This next segment of this video is showcasing how to use the artillery and we're going to try to take out these pillboxes in the distance over here. So what you would need is you would need a spotter to run up with a pair of binoculars and they would need to look ahead to see the defenses you wanted to shoot. So these are about 100 meters away from us. Actually, you can see from where we're standing here, 100 meters roughly. Okay, so it's about 110 meters. However, we look at the flags now. So we see the flags are currently going north. Small flags here, but you can get an idea there of a, a much larger flag there. So the wind is going against us, which means we might need to actually increase our distance even more. So with that in mind, I'm probably gonna go something like maybe 120. And then I'm going to uh, spot, and then I'm going to ask Schland to fire a shell out with Azimuth uh, wow. 151. Okay, and there we go. That was directly on target, so we, we were correct there in that assessment that we needed to increase a little bit more uh, on the meters because the wind was against us. Let's say we wanted to hit this uh, pillbox on the right. So it hit, it aimed on, uh, Azimuth was 146 uh, there, so I would need to go right by maybe a couple... Uh, on the gun, so I would tend to tell Schlan over comms, or if I was on a squad, I would communicate it, communicate that to him um, either locally if he was within earshot, or I would use the squad voice chat. And I'd tell him, "Could I? Could you go right to?" And then he would change that, and then he would f say, "Out with correction." When he has made that correction with the new shot, round out with correction. And there you can see that round bit more to the right so more accurate you've got to bear in mind that the, there will be quite a large spread on these shots so not if i if sham was to fire again it's not it's very unlikely it's gonna land in the exact same same place so if he fires again now so you can see it was slightly off there so but still fairly accurate if you could keep keep firing there for a bit there Shlan. so you can see there's a little bit of a spread there but generally um you know it's pretty tight and the reason why another reasons why it's fairly tight all that time it was quite far away is because it's we, we're fairly close to our target the further away we shoot the more of a spread it will be so the closer you are to the target generally the better your spread will be all right so now we're going to change target the 120 gun is still here we can't see it because it's uh in the snow if it was not there was no snow and it was daytime like it is now we would see it but because it's snowing we can't see it um you can see the shell on the ground, indication of where the gun is. So now we were hitting those pillboxes over to our left. We're now going to do a longer target. 
So we're going to go all the way over here now. And I'm gonna, we've got a truck over here in the distance. So I see the distance right now is about 116 meters, okay? And then I'm going to look to where the gun is and then I'm going to add on the, the distance there. So it's about 100. So it's about two, let's say 218. So let's go, so that'll be 220. We'll look at the wind. The wind is going directly north. So it's going to probably overshoot the shell, to be honest now. So we're probably going to go actually go 200 meters. So we always want to try and undershoot so we can see where the shell lands. So we'll try like 200 meters and the azimuth will be, so I'll see where the gun is. I'll turn around and look this way. So azimuth is probably going to be 118. But again, we've got to look, check at the wind. So that means it's going to shoot the shell further north. So that means we need to go much further right on the azimuth. Okay, so if it was about 118, we're probably going to try for something like 135. Okay, so we're going to go 200 meters uh, and then 135 on the azimuth, guys. It's also a good idea, guys, the people who are helping on the artillery and not in your squad to type the distance and azimuth into the team chat so they know what's going on. It's also a good idea to do this as not everybody understands certain accents. 200, 136. Okay, there we go. We see where the shot lands. So that was uh, in the you know direct in the correct direction. So we probably need to go up by 10 and let's go left by 15 on the azimuth. Round out with correction. Okay. Uh, went further right that time. Uh, that could be due to the spread. So let's go another 15 to the left on the azimuth, guys. And uh, again, increase distance by... Let's go up by 20. Or I would say to them, up by 2, which means 2 scrolls up on the mouse wheel, which is on a, on a 120 gun, up by uh, 20 meters. Round out with correction. And there you go, bang, right on target, right on the uh, the truck there. So now I'd say fire for effect, um, and hopefully, you know, the, the shells will ra land in a spread around this uh, this truck that we're trying to aim at right now. Also, bear in mind that good communication is key here, and Schlamm, my gunner, is doing an excellent job in this regard, because he's always telling me every time he fires a shell that he's made it with the new corrections. So I'm not left wondering if the late shell that lands is on the new or old coordinates. If you're using multiple guns, then it's a good idea to name them. For instance, Gun 1, Gun 2, and Gun 3. This is because communication is key and to avoid confusion between the gun crews and the spotter. If communication is on point, the spotter will know exactly which shells belong to which gun when they land. To demonstrate, when the first gun fires, the gunner would say, Gun 1 out. And the second gunner would fire shortly after, saying, Gun 2 out. This way, the spotter can see if any gun is off and then, they, then communicate back. So let's say gun 2 was off, they might say gun 2 increased distance by 10 meters, other guns are fine. This is great communication and should be employed by everybody. So where is a good place to use artillery? Well, generally artillery is brought up to help destroy enemy bases and thin out enemy numbers. It can be used defensively to stop a push and offensively to help take ground. Artillery also forces many of the opposing side to grade basic materials and repair structures that are being damaged by your artillery. This means there are less combat troops on their front line because they are all busy repairing. Furthermore, from personal experience, continuous arty fire has a huge toll on morale as players get frustrated having to constantly repair and die repeatedly due to the incoming fire. The top targets to aim for are concentrated defences where the spread of your artillery fire will always hit something, enemy bunker bases, and the top priority of all, enemy artillery. Typically in Foxhole, the side that wins the artillery duel ends up winning the fight, so make sure to be on the lookout for enemy artillery and try to prioritise shelling their pallets so they can't return fire. Mass 150mm guns are able to take down concrete bases in the late game. In this clip you can see the Regiment 141CR using many 150 guns to tackle a huge concrete base. Note that they are being counterfired by concrete AI howitzers. Usually I would avoid shelling this type of AI, however in this case they have overwhelming firepower and numbers to keep shelling and repairing their guns. It's also worth noting here that concrete AI howitzers only have a 120 degree firing angle in the direction that they are facing, so you can exploit this by firing at these guns with your own artillery from certain angles, as seen here in this clip where artillery is not being counterfired by the concrete howitzer on this bunker base. In this update, observation towers, both tier 2 and the concrete variant that you build, can now be crewed, giving you amazing vision. Do not need a binocular. As you can see, just right mouse click and then drag, you can see up to 232 meters. 
But if you have one of these available and you're on the defensive side, I highly recommend using this to spot for your own defensive artillery. Also when spotting, elevation dictates the amount you can see by. Here on flat ground, we can see up to 127 meters. And now in this clip, we're on our cliff and we can now see up to 175 meters. The Naval Warfare update introduces battleships and destroyers which come with 120mm and 150mm guns. To submit shells to these ships you must currently go below deck with crates on your character and submit them to their storage racks. You can grab shells from the storage racks and then submit them to the guns like this. The colonial battleship called the Titan has a total of 6 150mm guns and 2 120mm guns, whereas their destroyer has 4 120mm guns. The warden battleship called the Callahan has 6 150mm guns as well. To spot on a ship, there is a specific spotting seat located next to the helm. You can see up to 245 meters from this seat. Other players on the deck could also use a pair of binoculars as well. Firing and spotting on a ship is the same as if you were on land if you were stationary. However, if you are mobile and still firing the guns, you have to constantly change the distance and azimuth to hit your target. The 120 and 150mm ship guns have a much tighter spread when firing, making them very accurate. They also now have a direct fire mode which can be toggled by pressing Shift plus F and again back to indirect fire mode. Direct fire mode is great for shooting close range targets you can see from the gunner seat, however it does have a movement range. One last thing to mention is that you can only use the guns on these ships if the ship is not anchored. Also, you need to make sure that the gangways are pulled in. So guys, that's the end of the video and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did and want more content, check up over here and over here. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, make sure to click the button down here. I'll catch you in the next video, guys. Take care. And I'll see you soon.